Hey out there, this is Thursday, July 16th, 2020. And it is just about uh, seven minutes before eight in the morning here in Northern California. Excuse me. <coughs> That's a smoker's cough. I had pneumonia as a child. And uh, once you've had pneumonia, your lungs are scarred for the rest of your life. And they're kind of pitted and you get the phlegm tends to coagulate. But phlegm, it, it sounds awful, but, you know, it's natural part of the body like mucus or something. I mean, it's just one of those things that when you are a smoker your body produces extra phlegm <coughs> to protect your lungs you know, like a lubricant you know, pick it up and um, eliminate it uh, through the skin the skin is the biggest single eliminatory organ in our bodies but anyhow today I'm going to get into a lot of different stuff as usual and uh I wanted to talk about mood, attitude, spirit, and um, you know, many years ago I was going through a lot of heavy stuff in my life. My marriage was already shaky because I was a an immature husband, bad husband, and I was a good dad. Always been a good dad. Looked after my uh, kids like a uh, like a hawk, as they say, and um, but I was a crappy husband. There's no doubt about it. Um, but uh, I um, wound up uh, going through some tragedies, like everybody does, you know. And um, but I was having a really hard time dealing with the loss of my um, marriage, and that came after. Shortly after the loss of my third child, my son died of what they call sudden infant death, which is a generic term for, uh, we don't know. I mean, it's just a mystery to us because you know, this perfectly healthy baby boy, two weeks later, he's dead. And, uh, I mean, it's been called crib death. There's all kinds of theories about it, but um, it's interesting to note that um, a lot of people, researchers, including the Senator Rand Paul, who also is a doctor, says that he would uh, never allow his child to be vaccinated day one. And he attributes this, as so many researchers have, to this one of the contributing factors to the sudden infant death, that it happens more to these these babies that are vaccinated on day one, that their immune system's just still starting to kick in at that point, and they need the the greatest nourishment of all their mother's milk is the best thing they can have and that should be the only thing they have on day one but anyhow I did lose my my son died and my wife was divorcing me and I was very frustrated very upset and uh, having a very difficult time dealing with these extremely important people in my life that I was losing and um I ended up going to a mental health uh, facility just to get checked out. Say, you know, I wanted to talk to a shrink, basically, and counselor, whatever, therapist, and and uh, you know, see what uh, what was the score. But uh, basically, uh, you know, I never wasted these people's time too much, and uh, you know, they pretty quickly told me because I was having an emotional breakdown. He didn't say that. I mean, but it was obvious. I was crying with a perfect stranger. Uh, bawling my eyes out and uh, you know that must be tough for these people and I've got a lot of empathy for them for that reason but I've been through some of that stuff I've listened to a lot of stories myself as we all do we all end up hearing a lot of really heavy stuff in our lives you know it's coming from people that are often very near and dear to us and uh, sometimes it can be perfect strangers but uh, for whatever reason we feel compelled to listen to the stories in the case of a professional, of course, they're doing it for money. They're getting paid to do it. But in the case of family and friends and whoever else, uh, we do it because we feel like we need to, like we must, like we're compelled. We have a compulsion to do so. 
as a human being, a sentient being that's sharing the emotions of another. We care. We care about the horrific tragedies that people experience. And it's a very difficult, unpleasant situation to deal with. But nonetheless, we do it because we have a heart and we care. This is our godly nature basically coming out when we listen to people's tragic stories. But one of the things this health care professional, this mental health care professional told me was that um, I had a low tolerance for frustration. And as anyone can imagine, people like myself with this low tolerance of frustration diagnoses, which, I mean, I don't think that was entirely fair. I mean, for God's sake, how many people have lost a perfectly healthy two-week-old child? Okay, not that many, you know. And it wasn't even an accident. It was just, I don't know, you know, no autopsy, you know, I mean. Did the wife, did the mother strangle him, or suffocate him? Did, did the dad, you know, what happened here? Did they roll over on him in the night? They had him in the bed, you know? I mean, you know, no, really, I don't remember any questions even. I mean, it was just, you know, it is what it is. It's a dead baby, perfectly healthy. I mean, that's, you know, it's like mind boggling. But to, you know, that on top of shortly thereafter losing my wife, which was a shaky marriage, which was my own fault. Um, but, um, you know, so I don't think it was fair to say that I had a low tolerance. I'd say that, uh, you know, I had been going through a lot of heavy stuff. So I was uh, told I was clinically depressed, which seems to mean, well, you know, that's, you know, this is the definition of depression. And, and you know, we know what brought it on, what induced this. And, uh, okay, so what are you going to do, you know, so... Really, nobody can understand you at that point. And if you don't have a strong connection to God, which at the time I really didn't, I was kind of lost in space, wandering in the wilderness, if you will. And I wasn't going to family and friends so much because I didn't want to burden them with what I was going through. So I kind of sucked it up on my own. And, and I was pretty frail. I was never suicidal. I never felt suicidal, but I was decidedly going through some heavies, a lot of convulsions in my life that was I was dealing with. So it was almost a bittersweet experience because there's some sense of perverted satisfaction from feeling like you lost everything and you got nothing more to lose. It's just like, well you know, what, what can get any worse? I mean, nothing can hurt me anymore. I mean, but of course things can't, things can always be worse. But, um, you know, I mentioned all this because of all the stuff that we're all going through right now with this pandemic, as Catherine Austin Fitz puts it. And, you know, how I'm always telling people that our need for God and a personal, intimate, individual relationship with God is absolutely important, imperative. It's essential. It's not a, well, it's a nicety or something. No, no, no. I'm firmly convinced that the only way I got through all the stuff I've been through in my life, okay, because it, it got, it was precarious for a long, I mean, it was tough. I'll tell you what, okay. Listen, I was living down in Santa Cruz. This happened in 1988. That's the year my son was born and the year he died. My wife was decided to leave me shortly there. It was months, I think, when really she called it quits. And she was moving in other guys. And we were living in a condo that her dad had given her and or was letting her use, I guess I should say. But... Um, it was down in Santa Cruz and uh, Canfield Avenue. I still remember where it was. It wasn't, it was but a stone's throw from basically the boardwalk down there. But it wasn't a particularly good neighborhood. It was, um, at the time, it considered low rent probably. Those condos were probably going for, oh, I don't know, one or 200,000 bucks back then. 
something in that range probably, maybe less, but we're going back a while. But uh, it's hard to remember. I don't even know if I paid any attention at that time much. But um, I do remember we looked at a house in uh, the mid-'80s in Santa Cruz in the Prospect Heights neighborhood. And uh, this older man, his wife had died, and he was uh, leaving his house. It was owner for sale by owner. And he was asking 120000 bucks. Really nice neighborhood right across the street from a, an elementary school there. And um, God, how I wish I had just doubled down and done everything I could to make sure I secured that property. But it didn't happen. And um, anyhow, I don't want to get into all the gory details of what happened in uh, my short marriage and um, and everything else that was going on. But... Um, Anyhow, so in about 1988, 89, it was pretty much over. I was kind of just dealing with my wife seeing other men, and and I had to get my own scene together, and I got an RV, and and I put that in a, a mobile home park in Santa Cruz. It was at the uh, Pine Knolls Mobile Home Park there in Santa Cruz, and uh, and um, And it was pretty dark. It was pretty pretty rough, you know, watching my wife, um, um, you know, with other men and, uh, you know, having to let these guys know because I had two young daughters at the time. I mean, they were no more than three and five, I guess, at the most, and uh, maybe two and four, something like that in that range. They were pretty darn young. So I was really bent on at least making sure my rights were secured in this matter. And um, so I, I, I looked, I've looked. i been looking after my daughters like a hawk their whole lives, except once they entered adulthood. They were emancipated pretty young. I'd say 15, 16, they decided they could do things on their own, and they got jobs, and they got their own places to stay. And But... Um, My wife, after about a year or so, she decided to, well, at that point, we were still married in Santa Cruz in 1990, I guess, and she decided to move to Las Vegas. And uh, her, she had a lawyer that her dad was hired for. Her dad is multi, multi-millionaire many, many times over. At one time, my wife told me, I'm sure it was hyperbolic, but she said he had bought up half of Santa Cruz. He was a housing investor, real estate housing, landlord. Ran a property management company, and um, when I met him, I, I didn't know that he owned a casino in Santa Cruz, which I don't know how he got a permit to run a a gambling hall, basically in Santa Cruz. But the Sahara Gardens was called. He um, was an immigrant from uh, Iran. Uh, he says Persia. So, and his mother, he's got ties to the Shah of Iran, according to him and my former wife. And, and I know that his uh, his mom and dad are buried where the same cemetery in Santa Cruz. It's off Graham Hill Road where um, where my son is buried and uh, right nearby. And uh, his mom and dad are buried in these enormous tombstones. She was, she was apparently a princess at one time in uh, Persia. He calls it Persia, Iran. Whatever, it doesn't matter to me. I have, I know very little difference in one's historical name. and Ancient Persia, I guess. That goes back into the Bible. But um, 